Shalom, and welcome to Christian's Hebrew Connection, the teaching ministry of Gary Huff and the Hebraic Christian community and Israel, a ministry devoted to restoring the biblical Hebraic heritage of the Christian faith. Today's program, here are your hosts, Gary and Darlene Huff. Shalom, and welcome to our Bible study today. In this session, we're going to continue our study of the fall feast of the Lord. And our subject for this study will be the seventh and final annual biblical festival of the Lord, which will complete the yearly cycle of God's special appointed times and seasons. Now, this last feast of the Lord is called in Hebrew Sukkot, Sukkot, or in English, Tabernacles. Our scripture reading for this session today will be taken from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 16. That's the book of Deuteronomy chapter 16, and we'll be reading verses 16 and 17. That's verses 16 and 17, but before we do that, I like to do the ancient blessing in Hebrew, thanking God for the grace and the gift of His Word of God. So, if you want to, pray along together in agreement that God's Holy Spirit, His Ruach HaKodesh, will reveal the mysteries of the Word of God that only He can reveal to us. So if you don't mind, let's pray together. I'll do it in Hebrew and then English, but any way that the Holy Spirit gives you utterance, you pray in unity with me today. Let's pray. Barku Adonai Hamvarak. Barku Adonai Hamvarak Leolam Vayed. Baruch Adonai Elohenu Melech HaOlam. Asher Bacharbanu Mecho HaAmin. Vanatan Lenu Et Tor Tor. Baruch Adonai Notein HaTorah. Bashim Yeshua HaMashiach. Bin HaElohim Chaim Sar Shalom. Amen. We bless the Holy One, and we bless the Holy One forever and ever. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has elected us. You have selected us. You have handpicked us from among all the peoples of the earth and given us your word, your Torah of truth. Blessed are you, and we bless you, Lord the giver of the word, the Torah, in the name of Messiah Yeshua Jesus, the Son of the living God and the Prince of Peace, we do pray. And everybody said, Amen. Let's read from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verses 16 and 17. Let's read that together. Now the Bible says three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God, in the place. Did you see that? Three times. Let's read that again. Three times a year, all your male shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which He, God, chooses. When are these three times? It says, at the feast of unleavened bread. Secondly, at the feast of weeks. And finally, thirdly, and the feast of tabernacles. Watch this. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able. How? According to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. This passage says that there are three times in a year when the people of God are commanded to appear before the Lord. First, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread which is actually an eight-day celebration, which begins with the Feast of Passover. We all know about Passover, which is celebrated for one day. And it's attached to the Festival of Unleavened Bread, which is celebrated for the next seven days. Even though they're listed as two separate festivals, many in the first century grouped them together, these two festivals, and celebrated them as an 
eight-day celebration. For example, in the book of Mark, chapter 14, verses, verse 12, the writer recorded this. He said this, Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the first day, do you see that? It's talking about the first day of unleavened bread. Let's go on. When they kill the Passover lamb. Do you see that? It's talking about Jesus' disciples here. It says, His disciples said to him, Jesus, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? As you can see, even the, the disciples of Jesus considered it to be an eight-day celebration. The Scripture tells us that on the first day of the week, that'd be Sunday for you and me, during this eight-day celebration would be another feast called the Feast of First Fruits. So during this eight-day period, there are actually three of God's appointed feasts. First, Passover, and then unleavened bread, and the Feast of First Fruits. The Bible tells us in the book of Exodus, chapter number 12, and the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, that these three feasts take place in the biblical month of Abib in Aramaic and Aviv in Hebrew, which is translated in English as spring. So according to our text in Deuteronomy 16, the first time that the people of God were to meet with him was in the springtime. You see that? Next, the passage says that they were to meet with him, God, for the Feast of Weeks, or in Hebrew, Shavuot, which means weeks, it's plural. The people of God were commanded to count seven weeks, seven times seven, starting from the Feast of First Fruits on the first day of the week, which is 49 days. And then the Bible says on the 50th day, they were to celebrate the fourth feast. The word 50 in Greek is pente, pente. And the words 50 days in Greek is Pentecosti, Pentecosti. Or in English, we say Pentecost. <laughs> so 50 days after the people of God left their Egyptian bondage and passed through the Red Sea on dry ground, they marched 50 days, the Bible says, into the wilderness to Mount Sinai. Why? to meet with God and celebrate the first Pentecost as people who have been set free by the precious blood of an innocent lamb. The Bible tells us in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verse number 1, that the time of the first Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, was in the third biblical month called Sivan, Sivan, which, in, which is in the summer. Therefore, the second time that God commanded His people to meet with Him was in the summer. First the spring and then the summer. Now, our, pass, our passage says that the third and final pilgrimage festival, when God commanded His people to meet with Him, is called in Hebrew Sukkot. Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles or literally translated from the Hebrew word Sukkot, which means in English booths or little huts, huts, where the people of God were commanded to build temporary huts or little booths and celebrate by living in the huts with their families for seven days. Why? To cause them to remember God's protection and His provisions while they lived in temporary dwellings in the wilderness. According to Leviticus 23, this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, was supposed to be celebrated on the 15th day of the seventh month. That's very, very important. On the 15th day of the seventh month, which is in the fall of the year. Therefore, the three times, according to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16 and 17, the three times of the year when the people of God were supposed to come up to Jerusalem, to the holy city, to appear before their God in the temple, was once in the spring, once in the summer, and once in the fall. The spring, summer, and fall. 
Let's put these seven feasts together and look at the three pilgrimage festivals and see what we can learn by looking at them on this graph. First, let's begin with Passover. Next, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And thirdly, the Feast of First Fruits. And then completing the Spring Feast is Shavuot, or Pentecost, the first Pentecost. Although the fourth feast here, Shavuot Pentecost, happens in the summer, it's still connected to the spring feast. There are many reasons for connecting it with the spring feast, the first three. But one of the most important reasons is because of its close ties to the first feast of Passover. Because of its close ties to Passover, the first feast, it was given a nickname. And in Hebrew, it was known as Atzeret Shel Pesach. Let's say that again. Atzeret Shel Pesach, which is translated in English, the completion of Passover. The sages of Israel taught that the reason that Passover, the first feast, and the Passover lamb had to die was so that the people of God would be set free. Why? To come, to complete it at the Feast of Pentecost and come face to face and serve and worship with God, face to face, panim el panim. And while they were there, he would give them a sword. He would give to his saved people, the one that had been delivered by the blood of the Lamb, his commandments. Are there scriptures to back up the sages' claim? Of course so, yes. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 3 from the Bible, in verse number 12, God sends his servant Moshe, or Moses, to deliver his people from the Egyptian bondage. And then he instructed Moses what to do after they were freed. He says this. He says, when you have brought the... He's speaking to Moses here. He says, when you have brought the people, my people, out of Egypt, out of their bondage, you shall serve God on this mountain. What mountain? Mount Sinai. That was the purpose. So here God tells Moses that the reason that the Passover lamb had to die wasn't just to set his people free. But the purpose of their freedom was to be brought to Mount Sinai to worship and serve God and receive his commandments. So, the purpose, or better yet, the goal of these first three festivals was to get his people to Shavuot, Pentecost, which happened in the first biblical month of Nisan or Aviv which literally means the spring. Now we come to the three remaining biblical fall feasts, which all three are commanded to be celebrated in the seventh biblical month called Tishrei. These three feasts are known as the High Holy Days, which begin with the season called Teshuvah, or repentance. Why? Because we have to be prepared for the very next feast, which is the Feast of Trumpets. In other words, we must repent. You hear me? We must repent before the trumpet sounds. Amen. We also learned in our last session that these festivals teach us about the second part uh, or the consummation of a biblical wedding. When the trumpet sounded and the husband comes again to receive unto himself his awaiting bride and meets her halfway between her earthly home and his father's house where he had prepared a place for her or a wedding chamber for her where they dwell together for the next seven days or week. Or as we learned last time, it could be seven years together instead of just a week before coming out of their wedding chamber to be presented 
husband and wife forever to the whole wide world as husband and wife for, forever. The sixth festival on the biblical calendar is considered to be the most holy day in all the Bible. It's called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur in, in Hebrew or in English, the day of atonement which is to be celebrated, as the scripture says, on the tenth day of the seventh month. Again, that month is called Tishrei. Now it was on this day, the tenth day of the seventh month, that the last, listen to me, the last trump of God called the Shofar Haggadol, or the great Shofar would be sounded. Why? ending this 40-day season of repentance, when the gates of the city would be closed, signifying that whoever obeyed and didn't harden their hearts when he heard the voice of God, and they repented. They were actually inside the gate when the gates closed. But who, whoever didn't respond to the voice of God, and they hardened or crystallized their heart, they were left outside the city at the closing of the gates. We also learned last time that from the writings of the prophet Joel, that it was on this day, the day of atonement, the tenth day, that the husband and bride shall actually come out of their chamber where they had been for the last week or the last seven years. The prophet said in chapter number 2, verses 15 through 17, uh, Joel said this, Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. And when they appear, they will tabernacle, listen to me, tabernacle together forever as husband and bride, which is a beautiful picture of our husband, Yeshua Jesus, and his bride, the church. In the future, when the trumpet will sound, the actual trumpet will sound, and with a shout, as the Apostle Paul told the church at Thessalonica, that we'll meet the Lord, Paul says, at, with a shout and with the trumpet, we'll meet the Lord in the air, halfway, just like the wedding, halfway between his father's house, Jesus' father's house, and the bride's earthly home. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. My goodness. The Bible says in the book of Zechariah, chapter number 14, verse 4 and 5, the prophet says this. He says, On that day his feet, this is the Messiah, will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two, from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving to the south. And then in verse uh, 5b, the prophet says this, Then the Lord my God will come. Do you see that? On this day. And all the holy ones will come with him. The prophet says in verse number 5 that the Lord will come. But the passage also says that he's not coming alone. He says that the holy ones are coming to, Ma to the Mount of Olives with him. Now, the question is, who are the holy ones? It's what the passage says. And where have they been? Well, even the sages of Israel teach that the holy ones that are coming with the Messiah are all the Jews and all the Gentiles who put their faith in the Messiah as one new humanity or one new man. And where have they been? That's right. As the prophet Joel says, let the bridegroom, Yeshua, Jesus, and the bride, the church, as Zechariah calls them, the holy ones come out of her closet. Amen. Zechariah goes on in chapter 14. Verses 16 through 19, after the Lord's return, as the Bible says, that all people 
even the Gentiles are commanded to come up to Jerusalem and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they don't, even the Gentiles, the Bible says in Zechariah 14 that they won't receive the rain. Now, without rain, we starve because there'll be no water for the seed and there'll be no fruit. Those who does not, this includes, according to the scripture, the Gentiles that don't come up to worship at the Feast of Tabernacles will not receive the rain, which brings us to our final annual biblical feast called Sukkot, or booths, or huts, little huts, biblically known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's go to the scriptures and see what the Bible says about this last festival, the seventh festival. In the book of Leviticus chapter 23, verses 33 through 35, this is what the Lord says. Then the Lord spoke to Moshe, Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, now watch this very carefully, when? The fifteenth day, you remember? Day, the Day of Atonement is on the 10th, five days later on the 15th day of this same seventh month, which is Tishrei, shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, how long does God want us to celebrate with Him during this feast? Seven days to the Lord. On the 15th day of the seventh month, we are to celebrate this festival, even the Gentiles, according to Zechariah, this Feast of Tabernacles. How long? for seven days to the Lord. The Bible says that the Feast of Tabernacles begins five days, as we said, after the Day of Atonement, on the 15th day of the seventh month. And it lasts for seven days, as the Scripture says, ending on the 21st. It begins on the 15th, and it ends on the 21st day which if you'll remember is the third and final pilgrimage festival of our opening text in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 16. It's on this festival that the people of God were to construct these little booths or huts and live in them for all these seven days of the Feast of Sukkot or Tabernacle. Now, the way that these little Sukkot or booths were constructed historically were that they had to have three sides covered with branches or limbs from trees or anything else that had to be cut down. Uh, like today, since two before, uh, boards are wood from trees and had to be cut down. Many build them today partly out of wood and partly out of vegetation. It's okay. The front of this booth, or this little hut, this tabernacle, was to be left open. And also, they had to be a, a hole left in the roof. Why? So they would be able to see the witness of the stars. Keep that in mind. A hole ha had to be left in the roof so they could look up and see the witness of the stars. Since this is one of the three pilgrimage festivals, where all the people of God were commanded to come up to Jerusalem to appear before the Lord. Now, it caused a lot of problems. Like, because of the, the sheer multitude of the people that would travel to Jerusalem, where would everyone stay and sleep and get their families out of the weather? Well, although there, there were some inns or hotels in Jerusalem, and the surrounding cities, like maybe Bethlehem, which was just four miles down the road. Now, these inns and, their, and the hotels would fill up pretty quickly because of the multitude. And then there would be no room at the inns. But during this fall feast, the Feast of Sukkot, there'd be many of these little bitty booths and huts everywhere that people could stay in. Here's where it gets interesting. Now the singular form of the word Sukkot, as in tabernacles or booths, is the Hebrew word, the singular form is Sukkah. Sukkah. Now watch this very carefully. 
Now, the word sukkah in a singular form is also the word for, watch this, stable. Wait a minute. Let's look at this again. During this fall festival or appointment of the Lord, there would be no room at the ends, but there'd be all kinds of these little stables everywhere, constructed with a hole in the top of it, as you can see, the witness of the stars. Even if a woman was about to give birth, she was pregnant and she was about to give birth, there was still wouldn't be any rooms at the ends. But she could use one of these little huts or stables to give birth. By the way, just for your notes, it was considered cruel and illegal to have sheep and shepherds in the field in the winter time. Therefore, sheep and shepherds wouldn't have been in the field in the month of December, our month of December. But they would have been in the time of this fall feast, the Feast of Tabernacle. But we'll teach more on that later on during the Feast of Hanukkah. I'm not going to talk about all seven days of this feast. But we are going to look very closely at the last day of the feast. The 21st day. Why? Because it's the very apex, the point of the high holy days. It's the seventh day of the seventh feast. In the seventh month. Are you getting this? Which had actually 70 sacrifices offered on it during its time, these seven days. Since this day was considered the crescendo or the apex or the greatest day, the seventh day, the 21st day, it was considered the crescendo or the greatest day of the feast in the temple. On this last day, the seventh day of this feast, there was a special service designed to thank God, watch this very carefully, for the double portion, let me say it again, we're thanking God on this special day, on the seventh, the last great day of the feast, for the double portion of the fruit of the harvest that He, God, provided for His people during this festival of the ingathering of the second or double portion of the harvest. This feast is all about the double portion coming in. This special day, the last great day of the feast was given a special name. It was called Hoshana Rabbah. Hoshana Rabbah, which means the great salvation. This special service. On this last great day of the feast, Hoshana Rabbah, was carried out by, watch this very carefully, three groups of of priests. There would be three groups of priests during this service. This is how the sages of Israel describe the very first group of priests. And it's recorded for us in the Mishnah, in the section of the Mishnah called Sukkot, that's Tabernacles, 4.5. Let's read that together. It says this, There was a place below Jerusalem called Mozah. Now it says that people go down there and gather young willow branches. They come and they throw those willow branches along the sides of the altar with their heads of the, of the willow branches bent over the altar. They blew on the trumpet or the shofar, and this is the sound that the shofar was to make. Tikiah, teruah, tikiah. Now watch this. Every day they walked around the altar only one time. And they would say, Hoshiana, save now. We beseech thee, O Lord. We beseech thee, O Lord, send prosperity now. They also prayed this, Anivaho, save us, we pray. Anivaho, save us, we pray. Now watch this. And on the seventh day, this is Hoshana Rabbah, and on the seventh day, which is the last day of the feast, they walked around the altar, not one time, but seven times. This is how this first group of priests would perform their task. 
after they had cut down their willow branches. Now watch this. For six days they had marched around the altar in the temple one time. Each of the first six days, and what they would do, they would strike the side of the altar with their willow branches as they marched around. But watch this. But on the seventh day, the last great day of the feast, Hoshana Rabbah, they had actually marched around this altar seven times, striking the side of the altar as they marched around. What does that remind you of? That's right. Yoshua or Joshua and the walls of Jericho when they came tumbling down. After the seventh time around the altar, the priests would lean their willow branches against the side of the altar with the tops of the branches that was bowed over. Why were they bowed over? From striking the side of the altar, therefore making a canopy fit for a wedding, but they couldn't begin their seventh day march until the other two processions were ready and given the signal because all three of these processions had to begin at the same time. The second procession would include the high priest himself. Now the high priest would carry a golden vessel, a vase, and lead his procession of priests to the southwest side of the temple, to a pool of water called Salom, Salom, or Shelach, Shelach in Hebrew, which both means sent in English. When the high priest and his procession arrived at the pool of water, he had dipped the golden vessel, the vase, into the pool, filling it with water. Now, when the golden vessel was completely filled to the rim with the water. The water inside the golden vessel had a name change. It was called Chaim Mine, or living water. In other words, the high priest was carrying with him the living water. The second procession of the high priest and the living water would wait until the signal was given, and then they would proceed towards the altar to join those other priests, the first uh, group of priests that were striking the sides of the altar. Now, when the high priest arrived at the altar with the golden vessel of living water, he would ascend the altar where there'd be two funnels attached to two tubes that led to the bottom of the altar where he proceeded to pour the living water into one of the funnel, while pouring wine, or the blood of the grapes, as it was called, into the other funnel. So, there would be blood, watch this, and water flowing from the altar of sacrifice in the temple of God. I remember another altar where a sacrifice was made that had blood, and water on it. Now the Bible says when Yeshua Jesus, our Savior, our husband, was on the altar, the cross, it says that a Roman soldier pierced his side, and what came out? And blood and water came out of his side. The second procession with the high priest and the living water had a name. It was called Beit HaShoeva, Beit HaShoeva, or the house of the water pouring. That's what this ceremony was. The sages of Israel said this about this service of the water pouring. And it's recorded for us in the Mishnah in the section called Sukkot 4.10. They said this, Anyone who has not seen the rejoicing of the house of the water pouring, what the high priest with the living water, they said that has, they have never seen rejoicing in all his life. The third and final procession of priests would consist of about 15 priests. And what they would do, they would go down into the Kidron Brook on the eastern side of the temple. 
And these 15 priests, they would cut down a large willow tree. And the 15 uh, priests would lay the willow tree down. And then standing on either side of this willow tree would pick it up, allowing the long willow branches to drag the ground. And they would stand there holding the willow tree until they heard the signal. With all three priestly processions ready and waiting on this day on Hoshana Rabbah, the signal was given. But the signal given wasn't the sound of a shofar or a trumpet. It was the sound of a golden flute. Now, the golden flute wasn't what was significant here. What was significant was the name of the person who was playing the flute. That's what was significant. He had a name. His name, are you, get, are you ready for this? What was this flute player's name? He was called the Pierced One. In other words, the living water couldn't be applied to the altar until the Pierced One gave the signal. When the Pierced One gave the signal, the first procession of priests would march around the altar seven times while striking the side of the altar with their willow branches, while the high priest and his second procession would ascend the altar for uh, the outpouring of the living water in the golden vessel. And then there was the third procession. The 15 priests with the large willow tree would begin to walk in unison towards the altar of God with the willow branches swaying back and forth while it was dragging the ground as they walked. The sages of Israel said that the willow branches that was dragging the ground made a very unusual and loud sound as these 15 priests walked towards the altar in unison. The sages said it made a sound that sounded something like this. Or they said it sounded, get this, like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Which we know that Acts chapter number 2 referred to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, as a mighty rushing wind at the Feast of Pentecost, the fourth feast, which is in the summer called Shavuot Pentecost. But here, this is on the last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall. But watch this, where the double portion is poured out. That's right, you guessed it. At the Feast of Tabernacles, especially here on this great day, the seventh day, Hoshana Rabbah, the last great day of the feast, was a picture of the double portion of the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, where there's the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and also the outpouring of living water. With this understanding of the Feast of Tabernacles and the double portion of the Holy Spirit and the ser uh, service of the outpouring of the living water, let's investigate, let's use that, and let's investigate a particular chapter in the New Testament that talks about the festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's read the seventh chapter of the book of John in the New Testament beginning with verses 1 and 2. Let's read that together. It says, Jesus walked in Galilee, that's in the north, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. He later on went up. But it says the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So what's the timing of chapter number 7 of the book of John? That's right, the passage says it's the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. But which day of the festival is it? Well, let's keep reading in verse 37. It says this in the book of John chapter number 7, verse 37. Watch this. We know this now. On the last day, what? On the last day, that great day of the feast. We already know what this is. It's called Hoshana Rabbah. 
during the water pouring ceremony, look what happened on this last great day of the feast, Hoshana Rabbah. Jesus must have been watching here. Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart or out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. While watching this festive celebration uh, of the outpouring of the living water being poured out upon the altar in the temple of God, Yeshua Jesus stands and interrupts the service by saying this, If all would come to me, Jesus says, out of their bellies would flow the double portion of his spirit, proclaiming that he, Jesus, is that very living water, that he, Jesus, is the altar, and that he, Jesus, is the temple. Literally everything about the festivals of the Lord, or especially this one of the ingathering of the double portion, is all about Jesus. Amen. What a wonderful picture God has painted for us in these three pilgrimage festivals. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which the Scripture says leads us to the completion of Passover and the first portion of the Holy Spirit at Shavuot Pentecost. And then thirdly, the Feast of Tabernacles for the double portion of the Holy Spirit, a double portion of the Holy Spirit is portrayed by the mighty rushing wind and the outpouring of the living waters. Here's our three pilgrimage festivals. Passover in the spring. Shavuot Pentecost in the summer. You see that? and Sukkot, or tabernacles, in the fall. What does these three pilgrimage festivals have in common that we've learned? That's right, the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit. And right in the center, being used as the hinge, is Shavuot Pentecost, where the first outpouring is. As we saw before, that the first three feasts leads you to the first outpouring. And because we've come to the first outpouring, we now have access, watch this, to the next three feasts that allows us to receive the double portion. Now, these seven feasts, teach us about the characteristics of the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we conclude this session, I wonder while you're looking at this picture, if you notice something here. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? These seven annual biblical feasts of the Lord can be seen in the seven branch candlestick called the menorah, which when the angel of the Lord showed this menorah, this candlestick, to the prophet Zechariah and asked him what it was, how did the prophet Zechariah respond to him? Well, let's read what he said in the book of Zechariah, chapter number 6, verses 2 through 4. Let's read that together. He said, I'm looking. And there's a lampstand, that's a menorah, of solid gold with the bowl on top of it. And the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, Zechariah said, saying, What are these, my Lord? He said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Watch this. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. 
just as we learn from the seven feasts of the Lord, as we walk in these seven festivals of God, it teaches us about the characteristics of the first and second outpouring of His Holy Spirit. And as these seven feasts can also be seen here in the seven branch menorah, which Zechariah the prophet learned that it is also there to teach us more about the sevenfold Spirit of God. By hearing these words, the words of the messenger of the Lord, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this teaching of the Feast of Tabernacles and the outpouring of the living water. And I hope you'll join me next time when we'll continue restoring the Hebrew roots of the Bible and our Christian faith. So until next time, I'm Gary Huff saying, Yevicha Adonai Vaishmarecha. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you for watching Christian's Hebrew Connection with Gary Huff. We would like to thank our sponsors who make this program possible, the partners of the Hebraic Global Community. And once again, thank you for watching Christian's Hebrew Connection with Gary Huff.